let us look at what exactly we do in experimental research. Today we are going to explore what exactly is done when we do experimental research. This is an area of great interest to any scientist. It's a very accurate procedure done extremely carefully and used in the sciences and the social sciences. But in order to understand what exactly we do when we do experimental research is first we need to understand what is an experiment. An experiment is a scientific procedure that is undertaken to make a discovery or to test a known fact, to test a known theory, but of course we want to test it in our applied settings. So we often need a hypothesis, we need to formulate a hypothesis in order to understand how exactly this experiment should be run. Therefore, if you look at the verb of how to experiment, to experiment would mean carrying out such a scientific procedure in the laboratory preferably in some kind of very controlled settings. So that is exactly what we do when we do experimental research. What procedure do we actually follow in the best of experiments, the gold standard, what we call true experimental research? What we try to do is we try to hold one variable very constant and try to change another variable, the one in which we have interest. So what is done in an experimental research is to try and manipulate our experimental variable and try and present it at various levels to the subjects who are part of our experiment. Obviously, to do so, one would have to keep other variables constant, those variables that are likely to interfere with our experimental paradigm. Today, what we are going to see is how exactly these experiments pan out. Can all experiments fit this absolutely tight scientific procedure or can we have what are called quasi-experimental designs, pre-experimental designs. Because as a scientist, we need to have a variety of different experimental designs to choose from. Right in the end, we are also going to look at how exactly this connects with the statistical analysis that we plan to do with our results. So, when we are designing our experiment itself, we must be very clear about the various statistical procedures that are likely to come. What exactly does an experimenter need to do in order to have a completely foolproof experiment? The experimenter needs to introduce a particular treatment to the subjects who belong to the experimental group and to withhold that same treatment from the subjects who do not belong to that group. So finally, what we hope to do is to conduct a kind of comparison between these two groups assuming that we've been able to keep everything else constant. And then we try to conclude or draw conclusions about some kind of a cause-effect relationship between these various variables which were very much part of our experiment. Hence, what an experimenter would therefore do, and let us examine these terms a little bit. An experimenter is the person who is the scientist. So say you or I who are actually conducting this experiment, we are really in full control of the experimental procedure, the various steps that we are going to undertake. The subjects then are the people who are participating in this experiment, who are getting the various levels of the various treatments which we are giving to them. And we have to select these subjects very carefully, which is part of our sampling procedure for any experimental design. We now come to a very important term in any experimental design, which is a factor in any experiment. Actually, the term that we are going to look at a little later, the term factorial design, actually comes from this word factor. Every factor or treatment that the experimenter brings to the table is usually presented at a number of different levels. Each level represents a magnitude to which that particular factor is given to the subjects or is administered to the subjects. Let us take some simple examples. Suppose you're looking at a medical domain, then you might have different levels, which means different dosages of a particular drug, say 5 ml, 10 ml, 15 ml, which are given to look at what, has, what is the impact of that drug on the subject. Look at another field such as education, for example. 
One might look at the impact of a number of training hours on the learning of a subject. So subjects who have been exposed to one hour of training, two hours of training, five hours of training, these may be the different levels to which the subjects are exposed. The experimenter thus has to keep a good documentation, a perfect control over exactly how much of this variable has been dispensed to the subject in order to make sure that whatever cause and effect relationships are concluded from the experiment are accurate, that there is no vitiation of the various experimental conditions which were given to the subjects. Of course, this will also imply that we have certain control variables. So let us take a quick look at the three main kinds of variables that appear in any experimental design. First of all, you have the independent variable. As the term implies, this variable is the variable that is manipulated or controlled or selected by the experimenter. The independent variable is presented at a number of different levels to the subjects in order to see the impact and also a comparative study of the different levels of this independent variable. Sometimes, and we will look at this a little later, we might even have a continuous independent variable, but we may artificially divide it up into different levels. In fact, we might even make it a nominal variable in order to be able to generate distinct groups. For example, I may take a score on a particular test and then I may divide that score up into high and low. So high and low actually just become ordinal variables which I am comparing the impact on the dv which brings us to the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the variable that is actually being measured in the subjects. This is the variable that seems to change in some way, alter in some way, increase or decrease because of the treatment which the subjects have got. In other words, because of the level of the independent variable that is given to them. So the conclusions drawn are simple. If we have given different levels of the independent variable to the subjects and if their performance on the various dependent variables, there may be one or many, differ in some way, in a systematic way from each other and this is what we are going to test with our statistical tests and you know the hypothesis testing procedures that we are going to use later on, then we can say with some confidence that it is actually the impact of that independent variable that has brought about these changes. And then that brings us to the control variables which must be very accurately and carefully controlled to ensure that there is no other effect that is coming into our experiment. For example, if there were certain environmental conditions, if there are sounds in the background, there is higher or lower levels of light, all these different conditions might actually interfere with the impact of the independent variable and then you will no longer be able to conclude that impact with any kind of confidence, which is why control variables are also extremely important. Before we go further, let us take a quick peek at what exactly happens with the philosophical standpoint that we have, you know, when we do this kind of a scientific research. Because while we are conducting research designs or conducting experiments of various sorts, one must look at what sort of positivistic or constructivistic stand we are actually adopting. And that's what's important to look at here. If you really look at it, when you have this kind of a cause and effect relationship that is imposed on your research or that is being concluded from your research, then logical positivism lends itself very well to this kind of a theoretical standpoint. If you move to some kind of a constructivist approach, you are in a little more difficulty, a little deeper waters, because it's not so easy then to conclude in this kind of Newtonian manner a cause and effect relationship. So let us keep in mind that while we are espousing this kind of a true experimental design, we are often falling back on what we call logical positivist stance. So having thus established what kind of a philosophical standpoint we are approaching experimental research from, let us get our definitions very clear because we will keep talking about experimental groups and control groups and we have to be very clear what exactly we mean by them.
when we are looking at an experimental group, what we actually mean is the group of subjects who are being subjected to the experimental variable, the independent variable. Naturally, there may be many such groups because each group may be subjected to a specific level of that experimental variable. For instance, we may have an E group 1, E group 2, E group 3 and so on because using those examples I told you earlier about education or medicine, they may actually be getting different levels of the experimental variable. When we talk about a control group, we are talking about the group from which this particular variable is being withheld. Of course, it's very important in the beginning of our experiment to establish that these two groups were equivalent to begin with because otherwise making any kind of comparison between them at the end point will be actually quite meaningless. 